If you have 65 banks or whatever they told us that are on life support, I mean, what's going to happen if three or four or five or 65 of them fail at once in the face of real big problems in commercial real estate? What, trillion and a half dollars coming due to be reset at much higher rates here in, within the next 12 months or less? You have failure in all things and failure of trust in all things, including the banks and the markets. And and I think even the, the statistics that we are being lied to, people are realizing that that this isn't real. And so, yeah, having money in banks right now is 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 really, I think, never been more dangerous. And no one really understands, I think, how big the systemic nature of all of this is. Did you know that 65 U.S. banks are on life support, teetering on the edge of failure? Imagine what happens if just a handful collapse simultaneously. We're facing over $1.5 trillion in commercial real estate debt coming due at much higher rates within the next 12 months. The ripple effects could be catastrophic for our economy, impacting everything from small businesses to everyday banking services. Andy Sheckman warns that our financial system is far more fragile than we realize, and the mainstream media isn't telling us the full story. These banks are massively undercapitalized and over-leveraged, setting us up for potential financial disaster. Commercial real estate is turning into an urban doom loop, pushing people away from cities and causing a self-reinforcing exodus. If we don't pay attention, we could see widespread bank failures, triggering a snowballing panic that undermines trust in the entire financial system. You know, this rinse, wash, repeat uh, strategy that the commercial banks have inflicted upon the, the money managers who are just stupid because it keeps happening for years and years and years. It, it's a rinse, wash and repeat. They, the the uh, commercial banks will let the price rise. The, the speculators go long and then they come in and smash it leading up to options expiration, which then dashes the hopes and aspirations of the the money managers who go short and sell their longs and who takes the other side of that. It's the commercial banks and the thing rinse and wash and repeat. But as I said, you know, look, going back to before 2020, we never saw people standing or, or entities standing for delivery. It was a very unusual thing to see all of these entities and sovereign wealth funds and central banks and the others, as they were called in 2020, um, standing for delivery when these exchanges were designed they were never designed to be delivery mechanisms but that is indeed what has happened and going back throughout the years these countries who are standing for delivery like china and india um to name a few uh, weren't able to or had any desire or or were were really um coordinated or or, or cunning or wealthy enough to stand for delivery and and now they are and that's you know that's exactly what i think has been the fly in the ointment of 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 the western commercial banks who have been naked shorting the heck out of gold and silver for a very long time and maybe indeed that is what happened i don't know i mean look i, I i'd say this i find it silly that the western media comes out and and says all of this stuff i don't care what the paper said I think it's fair to say that no one knows how much gold really anyone owns. I mean, supposedly the United States has 8,133 metric tons of gold, but when was the last time that's been validated and verified? And my whole career, everyone said the amount of gold that China owns is way understated. And we were just talking about this from the perspective of the IMF and, and a lead analyst for Bank of Montreal who said the same things just a few weeks ago, that they way, 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 way understate things. Um, look, there are people that will tell you that since the beginning of the century, since 2000, 2001, 2002, that China's been accumulating anywhere between 1,000 and 1,500 metric tons a year, plus mining between four and 500 metric tons a year. So how is it that we're supposed to believe they only have 2,600 metric tons? This is why Alistair McLeod will tell you that they have more like 40,000 metric tons. And others would say things that are similar. At the same time, you have banks like ICBC uh, and others in China that are are are, are state-owned banks that are, are by proxy accumulating metal on behalf of the PBOC, and that is not reported to the IMF. Nor is all the metal that they produce. So I, I don't I don't really buy it. Um, but it's amazing what a little uh, rhetoric and lip service by by the mainstream will do, or even by the IMF, and maybe some suppression by 
Comex hoodwinking the man, the managed money into maybe just one more time going short and, and allowing them out of these, these, uh, these short positions. I don't know, but I'll tell you that, you know, these banks are working with the refineries in South Africa and in Switzerland. That stuff's not reported. If gold is not of 9995 quality, it's not reported to the IMF. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on that just isn't reported. And I don't know. I, then again, I, I don't know how much I believe it, to be honest with you. But I will simply say that uh, it's certainly if you wanted to take an optimistic angle on it and say that's exactly what they did. They worked out a deal to get them out of these positions. And maybe that's what is happening. I don't know. But again, this is just a, a, a correction uh, within a primary trend. I don't I don't put a ton of stock into all of this rhetoric. But what I will say to you is that I don't believe the Chinese are being honest with anyone as to how much gold they own and nor are we. For that, for that matter, why would we not have, uh, have audited mm -hmm. Fort Knox when Ron Paul asked for it? Why was it voted down? Why did it take years to give back the bars to to uh, to Germany? Germany, yeah. There's a million things that you can point to it and to to take that at face value, I think is silly. And, and it's not like the Chinese are making it easy on, on anyone either. I looked at the close yesterday at the Shanghai Metals Exchange. Silver is 33.44 an ounce, it's four bucks higher. So whatever is going on that's driving the price down, maybe it is one last one last push by the commercial banks to try and get out of their short positions before this goes crazy. Because I, I do believe that we are entering a new system where gold and silver and all of the world's commodities are being viewed at differently by these countries. And I don't think we've seen a change in anything, quite frankly, to, to think that I think is silly. And I think, you know, they're not just like the the banks aren't or, or the central banks aren't telling us how much gold they have. I don't think the FDIC and the Fed is telling us just how grim the situation is with the the banks here in the United States. They're massively undercapitalized and and very much over leveraged. And ultimately, I see rates going higher. There, I might be a minority that sees rates going higher. If if you see a short term pivot by the Fed the next meeting or, or that one after into the election. It's highly politicized, of course, but it, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, if the budget was balanced today, how do you pay for all the unfunded liabilities that exceed, you know, $200 trillion? How do you do that? And you take a look at this commercial real estate and it's turning into an urban doom loop. If you ask me, it's not getting any better. It's getting worse. You have people moving away from the cities just as things are starting to get worse. And then things get worse because more people moved away. Declining services and quality of life, it pushes the residents out and, and leads to a self-reinforcing exodus, this, this doom loop. And I think that, that that is happening when you're seeing these buildings that are selling for massive, massive, massive losses. It's just beginning. And and then, but the corollary effects, when you look at all the small businesses, you know, people aren't talking about the fact that, yeah, they hold all of the regional banks, hold all of the 70% of the commercial real estate loans. They also hold 70% of the small business things are, are um, we're being lied to. And I, look, I think that I wish inflation was only 3%. I, I, I think it's much higher than that, but that's putting strain on the small businesses. And um, I think this will get really, really bad. And it will only take one really big event to wake people up. We've talked about before, you know, that the, the bail-in legislation, while it hasn't reared its head yet, it is there. And if you have 65 banks or whatever they told us that are on life support, I mean, what's gonna happen if three or four or five or 65 of them fail at once in the face of Real big problems in commercial real estate. What trillion and a half dollars coming due to be reset at much higher rates here in, within the next twelve months or less? You have failure in all things and failure of trust in all things, including the banks and the markets. And and I think even the the statistics that we are being lied to, people are realizing that that this isn't real. And so yeah, having money in banks right now is. Is, is really, I think, never been more dangerous. And no one really understands, I think, how big the systemic nature of all of this is. When you take a look, and I keep mentioning this, this, this the, the third largest building in St. Louis, 44-story tall building, AT&T Center. 
It sold for $205 million in 2006. It just sold for $3.7 million. Now, that's just one example. How much more of this can happen? I saw UBS just took a massive hit on a bank in New York City. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars they lost. How many more of these can we take? And yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, everyone would run in years past out of the commercial banks, the big ones, because of their derivative positions, because how leveraged they were and would go to the regional banks. And we find out the regional banks are in worse shape than the commercial banks. And now we're being told that these big banks, the big commercial banks, they're they're not stacking up well when uh, when measured against whatever stress test or metrics that they're talking about, this living will, whatever the hell that means. But all I can say is that I think it's a, it's a fool's errand to believe that we are out of the woods with the banks yet. And just wait, one bank gets bailed in, it creates a snowballing panic. Mm -hmm. And this is why I believe a lot of this stuff is, is um, you can argue that it's almost this is what they want to do. They want to call the banks. They want to get to a point of, of bringing down the number of banks to issue a central bank digital currency. If that's indeed what they want to do, then yeah, the, the final chapter hasn't been written yet. And the American public really has no idea what's in store. Your, your listeners are very well informed. But I think when the people realize just how unstable and fragile the whole ecosystem is, and I, I'm still amazed. I talk to a lot of people that are still buying CDs in banks, locking themselves up mm -hmm. for a year, earning less money than you, you can get, you know, going to, in the US treasury, or even a money market with daily liquidity. And so the majority of people, even people that are sophisticated and well-read, reading the wrong things um, are, are not in any way, shape or form prepared to get out of the way of what they do not see coming. So yeah, banking problem, I think will, will, um, give us some more surprises in the coming weeks and months ahead.